um, as opposed to journalists um, and staff writers. Um, here are some examples of some types of scholarly journal titles. Books can also be considered scholarly depending on what press they are um, published in. Um, things to remember about dealing with scholarly sources, they're going to be very, very specific. So um, popular sources will give you oftentimes an overview of a topic because they're meant to introduce a general audience to something that could be kind of complicated, um, especially now with all this like election stuff and everything, there's could be a lot of like constitutional law. So when you're reading articles about that, um, it's going to kind of take an approach that is not going to be super specific, but and write about it in a way that someone who doesn't have a vast knowledge of constitutional law can understand what's going on. Whereas scholarly sources are written for other experts. So they're presuming that you have a, a pretty good background knowledge of what the article is about. And they're going to be very in depth and very like specific about one thing. So you'll notice that as you start searching for your scholarly sources, um, that they might be hyper specific about a certain type of audience or a certain type from a certain geographic perspective or take one very narrow aspect of your overall topic and examine that in depth. Um, expect that because that's very common for scholarly sources. Um, and if there's some aspect of the article that's not relevant to you, like maybe they're talking about um, the issue in another country or as it relates um, to a different type of demographic of people, but it's otherwise good, take a look at it anyway. There might be an idea or a concept that you can still apply um, to your research in that way. Um, because they're also written for experts, it's gonna contain a lot of complicated language, jargon. Um, they may be harder for you to understand, take longer for you to read. So just an like anticipate that and you know be patient with them and, and with yourself and make sure that you give yourself uh, ample time to um, digest these sources. Um, in college, you're expected to use scholarly sources because of their credibility, um, because that they present information in a more complex, critical way. But we also have to remember that they're not written for undergraduate students. They're written for the people who are teaching you, the other subject experts. So um, anticipate that kind, you know, give yourself some time with the sources and look up stuff that you don't understand. That's gonna be maybe a, a, a unique experience when we're used to reading um, popular sources or things online that are being presented to a completely different type of audience. The format, um, the most important thing is they're going to have um, works cited bibliography references, right? So every single scholarly peer-reviewed academic, those terms are used interchangeably, is going to have references, whether or not it's a list at the end, a work cited, a bibliography, whether or not it's footnotes or endnotes or notes along the side. Um, if it does not have citations, it is not scholarly academic peer review. That is a hard and fast rule. So if you do not see citations, you do not have a scholarly source. There also often will have an abstract in the beginning, which is a short paragraph explaining what the article is about, explaining its um, findings, if it's like a scientific research article. That's because it's probably long, it's probably dense, it's gonna take you time to read it. So before you invest the time, you know, to read like a 20 page thing, they're gonna tell you what's it about. They're gonna spoiler it for you and be like, okay, I actually wanna spend my time reading this because it is relevant to me. Um, also, you're going to often um, have um, an explanation of who the authors are. So they're going to give their degrees, they're going to give maybe where they work or what um, institution that they're a researcher from, because all of that leads to the credibility, right? These are supposedly experts, so you want to know that the person is credentialed to be writing about um, the subject matter at hand. So again, this is just verbally explaining what's in the within the chart that we looked at. But um, the biggest difference here is the peer review process, which we talked a little bit about when we were talking about popular sources. But the peer review process is what makes scholarly sources unique. Um, so before an article is accepted for publication, it is reviewed by other experts in the field. So um, literally a panel of people um, determined by that journal, review the article, 
and they read it for scholarly soundness. So um, are the things that they are saying um, evidentiary in nature? Are they making it up or are they getting it from somewhere? Does it have academic value? So does it contribute something to the field, right? Is it just the same information being republished or is it actually presenting um, information in a new way or a new way of looking at something? Um, are the methods reliable, especially when you're looking at scientific um, type papers? And um, are the findings valid, right? So a peer review panel will then suggest changes and then the author will have to go back and make those changes and it might go through another set of revision. Um, because of this peer review process, there are a lot of benefits to it, right? Because if someone is like rigorously checking this paper for lots of different things. So you're gonna know that once it finally gets published, um, you can, you know, have a pretty good sense of confidence in what the person is saying. Um, and that the sources are valid and that the ideas are backed up. Um, but also that takes a very long time. So you could just imagine, you know, you you are all spending a month writing, uh, writing this paper. This could go back and forth and back and forth. It can take months, sometimes a little over a year for scholarly sources to be published. So do, do not expect to find scholarly sources about very contemporary things. Um, because of literally just like the length of time it takes for these things to be published. So things that are happening right now, there will be many scholarly sources published on all of the things that are happening in 2020, um, but it may, may not be until 2021 um, until those things go through a, a rigorous peer review process. Um, you might be reading about peer review with like the Pfizer vaccines, you know, and all the articles that you might read about that. It says clearly the findings of the, um, of like the vaccine trial have not been peer reviewed. That's why it's been so fast, right? So that's part of um, the process. And you can see the peer review process happening in the real world and impacting us in a very real way. Um, but again, your most important thing about scholarly sources are um, extensive references. So um, always, always, always look for those references. Bibliography works cited. Here's some examples. Um, you'll see that scholarly sources, journals can be very, very specific in nature. They could be about um, a particular field or one tiny subset of a field. Um, this is not at all uncommon. Um, and you can see this is generally how a scholarly journal article might look. Um, there it gives the authors their degrees um, that um, little chunk at the beginning there is your abstract. It'll often have um, not a lot of pictures, not a lot of graphics that we would expect in like a magazine. And there are your references at the end. So um, very, on a visual sense, scholarly journals will present very differently um, than popular. Um, there's different types of scholarly literature. So just as there are different types of popular um, sources. So some are straight up news sources that are just going to explain something to you in a very as you know objective as a human being writing an article can be. Some sources are there to convince you of something if it's like an opinion piece. Some articles are there to entertain you um, or um, maybe some of them are satire, right? So popular sources, there's a bunch of different types. The same goes with scholarly literature. So there's different types of scholarly articles that you might come across. Um, I just want to introduce you to this idea. You don't need to, you know, stress out about remembering all these different types. Um, but just know that sometimes you'll have articles that are strictly presenting data of a report. Um, and they might have one or two conclusions, but the whole article might be like, we did this research, here's what we found. Or another scholarly article more in the humanities might be talking about theory you know, breaking down a like theoretical concept and drawing from research to present a new way of looking at a piece of literature or a work of art or like a sociological idea. And there's also reviews. So sometimes there's extensive reviews of literature or um, reviews of other people's research. Um, and then there's gray um, literature, which is, kind of falls in between. And these things are often not formally peer reviewed. 
um, but they fall more in like the sciences. So a lot of stuff that's being published about COVID right now falls within the gray literature because scientists um, and researchers want to publish everything they can about COVID right now. And they're being a little lax with the peer review so that everybody can have access to um, the information because the entire scientific world is only focused on this one thing right now. So the more that they can share information with each other, the quicker, the better. Um, so just a slight word of caution, I'm gonna tell you and teach you some techniques to have the databases only deliver you scholarly peer reviewed academic journal articles, but they're not perfect. And not everything published in a scholarly journal is considered peer review or appropriate for research. So you'll notice, um, especially depending on your topic, that scholarly journals like to publish book reviews. And these can be very handy. You know, someone published a new book on something um, and then other people who are experts in that same subject area will review the book. Is it um, kind of in the same, a little bit of the same um, criteria for like the peer review? Um, you know, is the book contributing something? Is it worth your time? Is it worth buying? Um, but book reviews, the article itself is not peer reviewed. Um, sometimes scholarly articles or scholarly journals will have like editorial pieces. So the editors um, will comment on something that is impacting the field, but that is not strictly a scholarly peer reviewed article. And sometimes they'll just have news pieces. Like this is a thing that happened. This is a, someone got a new job in this very like influential like position. Those kinds of news um, things you'll, off, you'll also find in some scholarly journals. Those types of articles will not have a bibliography. So that is, again, your number one most reliable way. So even if the, if the library databases tell you this is a scholarly peer reviewed journal, um, if you look at it, you're like, oh, this doesn't have a references. It's probably pretty short. So it's gonna fall into one of these other things. Okay, so where to find them? and how to find them. So most of the library databases include scholarly sources. Um, we're gonna look for filters in the database to help limit your results to just those types of sources. You'll see peer reviewed, you'll see scholarly, you'll see academic. These terms are used interchangeably um, generally, but I've screenshot a couple of examples of how this looks in the, in the various databases for you to use these filters um, to, get you at least, you know, 95% of the way there. Again, as we were just talking about, always look, see if there's references. If there is, then you know that um, you have a peer reviewed source. So where do we get them? Um, some of these databases might be familiar to you from last time. Um, so we're gonna go through them and how you can manipulate them to get you to those scholarly sources. But what is a database? Um, a library database is an online resource that the library subscribes to that contains articles and other information. Most of the stuff that you find in an article database was originally published in print. So especially when we're, when we're talking about scholarly peer review. So these are things that were and are published in print format, but also available online. And you'll see that in the way they're presented as PDFs. Um, they are still presented as if I'm picking up a print journal off of a shelf. Um, so there are many different types of databases that we have. For college writing, you're mostly going to be using article databases, but we also have databases of images. We have databases of music, of streaming film, of, um, you know, films, um, uh, playwriting. So um, a database is simply like a collection of of things. So we're mostly going to be concentrating on um, the article databases. And there are two basic types. There are some um, databases that just give you the citations and then other databases that give you full text. And you'll kind of see how that um, plays out. So um, even though that you're accessing all of the library's databases online, through the internet, they're not considered a web source. Um, so for those of you who are in Peter's class, and I know that different college writing professors have different um, 
criteria. Some say, you know, you can have sources from the web. The, the library databases wouldn't count as web sources um, in that sense. So consider them as, you know, almost like the library's like print, print collection because most of these things um, started out in print. Okay. So we're gonna talk about four different ways to find your scholarly sources through the library. So here we are back again, the library's homepage. Since I'm ready to begin gathering up my sources, I'm gonna have Zotero open and ready. You might remember from last time that we should make a folder or a collection for this paper. So just to review, here I am in the basic My Library. I'm gonna make a new collection. So college writing, essay three, you can name it your topic, whatever it happens to be. That's just an important um, organizational practice so that if you have stuff in here from essay two, that you've completely changed your topic, you don't wanna intermix that research. Um, if you like Zotero and using it for uh, your other courses, you don't wanna get your um, research mixed up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, hold on. Okay, so now that we have this um, highlighted, everything that we save today is going to be for our college writing essay three. So part of doing research and being, you know, a good researcher is keeping your stuff organized. We have to find the stuff, but we also have to make sure that we can get back to it later and that it's organized in a way that it's helpful for you when you actually begin writing. So that's why we use Otero and we create our little folder here. So um, our first avenue is discovery. So we'll remember that being the main search box on the library's homepage here. Discovery is your most comprehensive, your widest possible net. It covers many of the library's databases. So instead of doing individual searches in library databases, which is how library research used to be, we have discovery, which allows you to search hundreds of databases with a single search. Um, it is very interdisciplinary in that way. So you'll notice that a lot of the library databases are individual to certain disciplines. So there's databases that just cover chemistry and um, databases that just talk about architecture and databases that just talk about um, film and television research, right? So, um, and those have a lot of great use, which we'll talk about in a bit, but sometimes your topic is interdisciplinary that crosses a, a, over a bunch of different disciplines. And that way discovery search is really helpful because you can search on a topic that may be related to medicine and sociology and business and search all of those types of publications at the same time. But also keep in mind that because discovery search is so huge, um, the context in which you are searching, you know, your universe of information is also um, very wide. So I kind of use the example of vinyl. If you search for the word vinyl in discovery search, you're going to get stuff about the chemical makeup of vinyl. You're going to get stuff about vinyl as it relates to records and LPs, right? Um, whereas I search vinyl in a music database, I'm only going to get stuff in the context of vinyl as it means for music, right? So think of it that way. Discovery search can have um, its pluses and minuses. We may also remember from when we met last time that we spent some time thinking of some keywords. So your topic should have two or three, maybe four different elements. Um, and we want to have a search box for each one of those keywords. So I only have one here. So what I'm gonna do is just leave this completely blank and I'm gonna press search because I wanna get up here to advanced search. And I want that because I have multiple search boxes. So I want to enter in my search terms in each box, each line here, like individually. Um, the databases don't operate well if you just put them in like a long string or if we put like a whole sentence in, we wanna break that out. So um, we're doing junk food and marketing and we're at a line here and children, right? Okay, 
And we also are seeing up here that we have some options. Right now we're interested in articles. So we're gonna click that because I only want discovery search to bring me articles. I'm not concerned about books, courses or stuff like that. That's not relevant to me right now. Okay, I'm gonna sign in uh, because discovery search wants you to sign in with your purchase credentials. And that just allows you to see um, the databases that have the um, full text content. And then over here, I might want to come over here again and limit my results to articles again, as opposed to these other things that fall within the overall um, article umbrella. And we have one more limiter. We have our peer reviewed journals, right? So we want to make sure that we're telling Discovery Search that we only want those peer reviewed things. So here I can begin looking through my pages of results. And as you're looking through, you'll you'll see what I was talking about before of uh, things that are like very specific context. Like, right, so this is junk food advertisements um, as it relates to First Amendment law, right? Which is this one very narrow aspect of this. And this is junk food um, advertising on Facebook specifically, right? So there might be something in here about how, um, certain types of foods are advertised online, even though this is specifically talking about Facebook and my paper isn't only about Facebook, but there's probably something in here that I can use and that might be relevant to me, right? So if this looks interesting to you, click on it. All of this down here will tell you how you can um, access it. So all of these links should work. That just is telling you that multiple different databases have this journal and have the full text. So this is in Journal of Public Health. Here's your PDF full text. Um, and here you can actually read the article. Um, you can look through it. It looks kind of how I would expect a scholarly source. I have my charts and graphs. Um, and here are all of my references, right? So I feel pretty good about this as being a scholarly source. If I know I want to use this, this looks good. Save it to my Zotero. Remember from last time that we don't want to use discovery search here to save because we don't have the PDF, right? The PDF lives in here. So here is where we want to save to Zotero using the little icon because that PDF will come over and that's what we want, right? So forever in here, we'll link to this um, PDF. And so we don't have to worry about getting back to it later. It'll always be here for us. And again, as remember as last time, take a look at your subject terms. They might help you um, think of alternative ways of doing, of describing what it is that, that you're looking for. So let's go back to our discovery. As you look through your results, you're going to see what I mean about the interdisciplinary approach. We have things from a law perspective. We have things from a public health perspective. We have things from a consumer behavior perspective, like more like a business perspective. Um, we have some, a journal that just talks about, um, here's something in British Food Journal, again, consumer behavior. So you can begin to see that this is gonna cross many different disciplines. Um, and in some ways that could be um, really helpful to you to, depending on what your topic is and might help you um, narrow down the perspective that you want to approach your, um, your idea. So again, discovery, we just want to enter empty search box because we want to use advanced search up here. We want to enter all our search terms on individual lines. We want to filter articles and we want to filter peer reviewed journals. Right. Um, if, if for whatever reason you're not using Zotero, please use the permalink here. This will always get you back to this particular source. Um, do not use the URL bar link up here. There's a lot of information in here that's um, session like specific and that URL might break. So always use your permalink um, if you want to get back to something if you are not using 
um, this to save, to save your stuff. You don't have to worry because um, Zotero will always use the permalink by default. Okay, so that's discovery. The next two, um, I believe I introduced to you last time, but as a review um, are also um, general databases as we call them. They don't have a subject um, like, like specific that they cover. So Academic Search Complete and ProQuest Research Library are general databases that are interdisciplinary, but they are not nearly as huge as Discovery because they are just one individual database, whereas Discovery are searching hundreds at one time. But they are very helpful and they're um, some of the best to use, especially when you're just starting out your research and you're just like starting out to begin to be um, a like college level researcher. So back to the library's homepage. Instead of using discovery, I know that I have individual specific databases. Kim told me to use these, how do I get to them? I come here to databases by title. Here are the list of all of the databases that we subscribe to. I'm going to go to Academic Search Complete and press go. So this database interface might look familiar than to the one I was just in. Um, there are two basic database vendors, EBSCO and ProQuest. They provide access to a bunch of different databases. So just because the screen looks similar, Keep an eye on this up here. You're searching Academic Search Complete. So you'll see later that I'm gonna use other databases that look just like this, but it'll be searching a different database. So it'll be searching a different set of journals completely. Um, keep an eye on that. Like oftentimes students will be like, I was searching the EBSCO database and we probably have about 80 databases from EBSCO. So instead of saying that, take a look at the actual name of the database and that, um, is more meaningful. What I like here is I already have my search boxes presented, right? So I can already begin to type in um, my discrete terms. And I'm going to use my limiters. So over here, I have my scholarly peer review journals. Yay. And again, I can limit myself to academic journals only. You might also um, decide, depending on your topic, that you want to use um, the date slider. Some of these databases contain articles from many, many, many years ago. So depending on your topic, you may want to say, OK, I'm only interested in research from the last 10 years. Um, that's something that you can determine. Some of your topics might be more um, date dependent than others, especially if they relate to technology or like current legislation, things like that. Um, unlike discovery, um, you might have to, um, the, the PDF might not always be obvious to you in here. So you might be something, you might see something more like get full text from purchase. So if you see an article that you're interested in, and you don't see the PDF available right away, you will see the get full text from purchase. Click on that and it'll tell you how you can get the full text. One of two things is gonna happen. Either a different database will have the full text or you'd have to place a request for it. So depending on your topic at the college writing level, you shouldn't really need to be getting articles from other libraries, which is interlibrary loan, which is what this means. But if you find something that you're desperate to have, that is something that is um, available to you. Um, any article that you ask for from another library will be um, delivered to you as a PDF. So you don't have to worry about having to go to the library or anything like that. Um, it just involves a little bit more clicking. So if you guys have questions on that, I can go over it at the end. Um, but just, I just want you to know that that's something you might encounter because the library doesn't have access to every single article ever library share with each other. Um, but you might, oftentimes you will see um, the PDF. So again, we want to save to um, Zotero from where we see that PDF. So here I have that saved. If 
if you wanted one of these that didn't have um, the PDF right away, you can still save that metadata. So you can still save the article information. You see it didn't bring over the PDF because there isn't one here. And then if you ILL'd for it and you got that PDF delivered to you via email, you can always drag and drop your PDF into your, into your like library here and that'll attach itself to this article. But again, we don't have nearly as many. We have 54 results, whereas in discovery, we were in the thousands. But they are from a couple of different disciplines. You know, we have stuff talking again here about law, about public health. Um, you know, this is here's another law article. This is about like oncology. So you can see this is a general type of database that is going to cover things from a couple different perspectives. Similar to Academic Search Complete as ProQuest Research Library. Um, they're kind of, you know, ProQuest and um, EBSCO, the one that runs this one, they're the main competitors in the library database world. So no surprise that ProQuest has its own version of this. Um, I'm gonna scroll down to ProQuest Research Library, press go. So this is the other interface that you're most likely gonna encounter. This is ProQuests. I'm gonna click over here to advanced search because again, I want my search boxes. I'm gonna enter my terms. And each of these databases functions a little bit differently. They have a slightly different algorithm that controls um, how the information is presented to you. And they um, have different um, licensing um, like agreements with different journals. So it's nice to search a couple of them because they're not all searching the same information. You might see the same articles pop up, um, but also you're going to see different things in different ones. So here we want peer reviewed and we want our scholarly journals. And you'll notice that the filters are in the same place along the left side here. That's where you'll expect to find most of these type filters in almost every library database. They're always gonna kind of be over here. Again, here you can determine your date as well like we were talking about before. So we can take a look at the second one. And here's your PDF full text. And if we look at it, we can see that it may ring a little bit of alarm bells with us because even though we clicked academic scholarly journals, I see here that there are no references with this, right? It's short, it's only one page, there's no author information. All of those things tell me that this is a article that's published in a scholarly journal, but the article itself is not scholarly peer reviewed. Um, it is just kind of like a announcement telling you that this report exists, right? But maybe one day there'll probably be a scholarly article that examines the report. But because I don't see references, I automatically know this is not scholarly peer reviewed, even though I use those database filters. It's important for you to just always give it a double check. Okay, let's just go down. You'll see through your results, you make these familiar articles, some different articles. Again, you're gonna get stuff from different perspectives. Here's, here's your PDF. So this is how we wanna capture it, right? And so far, the information that we have been relying on has been information that the databases have like presented to us. So we are relying on um, how the databases function, how they are programmed to deliver information. So when you put your search terms in, there's a program that happens and it tries to use that program to determine what information it thinks it's best for you, which is how Google works um, as well. But also we wanna have a little bit more of a human approach to how we look for information. So because scholarly sources will always have a references list, we should always look at that references list, especially for an article that's really helpful. Odds are, because the people who wrote this article referenced these things, the, some of these things might be helpful to you as well. So instead of simply relying only on what a search algorithm will do, take a look at the references and be like, oh, this, this is, there's some good stuff in here. I might as well 
um, use what somebody else spent all this time doing research and help my research be better by that, right? We don't wanna cite only the same stuff they've cited, they've already written that article, but there's probably a couple things in here that could be helpful for you. How you get access to that, um, it depends on what it is. So if you look at something like this, could targeted food taxes improve health? I can tell by the way that this um, citation is structured that this is a journal article. Um, it has a title, it has the journal name in italics, it has a year, it has an issue and a volume and page numbers, right? Whereas a, whereas a book is gonna be cited very differently. Books don't have volume and issues um, and things like that, right? So this looks great. How do I find if the library has this? Well, you'll often notice, especially in scientific um, publications, that they will um, abbreviate the titles of things because they want to take up the least amount of space because it costs money to print paper and ink, right? It's, it's literally why they do this. So copy and paste the title here. Let's Google it. And Google will tell me that the actual title is here, right? Which is different than this. So this is, we want to take this copy that, come back to the library's homepage, come back to discovery search, paste the title into here. And instead of having it um, selected to almost everything, we're gonna do journals A to Z because we wanna know, does the library have access to this journal? We press search. And we see that it does. So that's step one. Step two is looking at our dates. So if we look, go back to the article, we see that this is from 2007. So we come back over here and we see, okay, in JSTOR, this is only available till 1979. That's not gonna work. In this one, it's only available until 1979. That's not gonna work. In PubMed Central, it's available from 1979 until there's no end date. That means until the present or the last published um, journal um, issue. That is my best bet, right? Because I need something from 2007. So if I click on that and I navigate to the journal issue, 61.8, that matches what the um, citation is. And then I see, and then I scroll down. Here's my article. Here's my PDF, right? So here, from here, I was able to get another really good article, right? From just from this one, I was able to get, and who knows how many other, other good ones there could be, right? So those are your two basic research strategies. Use the databases, use them effectively, use your filters, um, but also look at those references and see what the, uh, what the authors are citing and try and find those articles yourself. Okay. So the final place that we're gonna talk about are individual subject specific library databases. So discovery search, academic search complete, Procos Research Library, these have all been general interdisciplinary sources. Those are helpful for many reasons. However, as you're going through your research, you might be like, okay, I keep getting stuff from this perspective. I'm really tired of like the health medical perspective of junk food marketing. I really wanna look at like the sociological impact, right? So what does it actually mean for like a, a child's social upbringing to not be bombarded with these types of like advertisements? So back at the library's homepage, we're going to expand the research by subject guides. And these are all guides that different librarians have authored um, that pertain and have a curated list of resources that are most relevant to these broad subject areas, the things that you would major in here at Purchase. Um, so think about your topic, take a look at these lists, think about the information that you need or the perspective from which you wanna view your topic um, and see which one's most relevant. So if I'm looking at a, like a sociological perspective, I may wanna click on sociology, right? If I wanted to come at my topic from a different perspective, um, you know, I would look at one of these other types of research guides. 
but let's look at the sociology guide. All of the guides follow the same format and template. They'll all have an articles tab. And within that articles tab will be a list of databases. The databases generally will not be in alphabetical order, but they'll be in order of the best one, quote unquote, that you should use first. So if you're not a sociology major, you don't know what's the best like sociology um, resource to use, look at the one that's there first. That's the one that the librarian who put this together wants you to use first. So we'll see that it looks familiar to Academic Search Complete, but instead of searching Academic Search Complete, we're searching Social Index with full text, right? So even though it looks the exact same, we're searching a completely different set of information. We can redo our search and see that we're going to get articles that are just kind of from this sociological perspective. We only have 13, whereas before we had an um, 54 or something like that. And I would expect that because we're searching a much smaller universe of information here. We're searching things that are about sociology as opposed to academic search complete, which were all of those things. It has your same filters, your scholarly peer reviewed, your academic journals. So you'll, you'll become very like familiar with those, with those filters. Right, so again, you can go through, um, see what's interesting, save, save the things that you want to save to your, to your library, right? Okay. So between all of those things, you all should be no problem finding um, research on your topic, right? So there's lots of resources um, available to you to help you get access to scholarly sources. Please use these ones through the library. Google is not great, even Google Scholar is not great at finding scholarly sources because scholarly sources are generally not freely available on the internet. You need to pay for them. The library pays for all of these resources that I showed you because um, those databases then strike licensing deals with these journals. So academic publishing is a very capitalistic enterprise. Um, so it involves, you know, not find, finding things and publishing them freely available um, online. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Everyone should have access to all of this information, not just people who can afford to be um, going to college or have a college login, but that's unfortunately the current state of academic publishing. Um, so that's beginning to change a little bit, but not quite yet. So um, the important thing is use these resources through the library while you have them. They will give you a completely different set of results than Google because Google simply cannot search these things. It cannot give you the full text um, of these things. So just as a final review of how um, Zotero works, you have your stuff saved, right? You're happy with your bibliography. You can come in here, as you might recall, have your um, Google Doc open, your Word Doc, your pages, your notepad. I've already set this up to tell it that I want an MLA, if you guys remember that from last time. And you can drag it over into your Google Doc. And then here, it'll help you begin to format those like MLA citations. As we talked about last time, always, always, always check them against the standard. Al Purdue, a different writing um, lab that you find online, a different template that you get straight from like the MLA handbook if you own that. Um, but this is just a computer generating these um, MLA citations for you. They can make mistakes, but it's so much easier to start from here and then delete and take a couple seconds to clean these up than to start from scratch, right? Which can be kind of stressful and most people find that annoying. So do your Zotero, do your dragging and dropping, take the extra seconds to compare it to what a MLA, a properly cited um, MLA scholarly journal article should look like. Okay, who has questions about anything that I talked about? Any of the databases, um, Zotero, using um, the subject specific research guides, 
or subject specific um, databases, any, uh, any of that stuff. And if you do have a question, you can put into the, into the chat or you could just unmute yourself if you're comfortable with that. Okay, no questions, that's okay. Most of the time your questions will come as you start working with these resources. Um, can I start from the beginning? I cannot, <laughs> only because I have to feed my baby dinner pretty soon. Um, but this is recorded, I think. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I figured you were kidding. Um, I think this is recorded. I don't know, Peter, did you record this one? I did record um, it. Yeah, so this will be, it, it, you know, if you need anything reviewed. Um, I'll, you I'll share it with you guys all later today, I promise. Yeah, and you have this PowerPoint as well. It's the same one from the popular um, session. It, I just added on to the end of it. Um, but if you do have...